A uh, very good evening to the esteemed chief guest for today, Mr. Kothwal, who's uh, kindly consented to speak on a very important topic, which is uh, technology, a prime mover for growth on the occasion of uh, National Technology Day 2023. Uh, before we go on and I request the president to say a few words, I will introduce the today's speaker to you, uh, Mr. Kothwal. Uh, uh, we all know he's an eminent personality. He graduated in mechanical engineering from University of Mumbai and joined LNT in 1968. He retired in 2015 August as a whole time director on LNT's board after 47 years of service. He was responsible for heavy engineering, shipbuilding, and LNT's facility for heavy forgings and special steels. He's played a key role in, uh, in leadership with the company with complete PL responsibility in manuf and manufacture of critical equipments and systems for various core strategic sectors such as nuclear power, space research and defense, as well as refineries, petrochemicals and fertilizers, covering both domestic and international markets. He set up several unique world-class manufacturing facilities such as super heavy fabrication and shipbuilding workshops, special steels and heavy forging facility, facility at Hazira, advanced composites and special light fabrication in Baroda, a strategic systems complex at Talegao in Maharashtra, a precision manufacturing facility in Coimbatore, large modern shipyard near Chennai, and heavy fabrication facility in Oman. And almost all of these were greenfield projects. He's played a key role in establish, establishing modern marine and design, marine design and engineering centers for submarines and ships in Mumbai and Chennai, and a strategic electronic center at Bengaluru. He was selected as part of a technology advisory group for the multi-billion dollar International Thermonuclear Experimental Nuclear Fusion Project, ITER, coming up in France and for which LNT is supplying the cryostat, the largest portion of the Indian contribution. He is a member of Vijay Kelkar Committee on Defense, a co-chair of CII Defense Committee, a member of National Aeronautics Advisory Group of Government of India, and chairman of FIKI Defense Committee. He has also been chairman of PPMAI, that is Process Plant Manufacturers Association of India. He has been recipient of the Business Leader of the Year Award in 2009, given by Chemtech Foundation. He was still recently member of the Governing Council of INE and chairman of its Pune chapter, and currently a member of Pune International Center, DIE Board for Research in Nuclear Sciences, and an independent director on boards of Sangvi Movers Limited and Kirloska Ferrous Industries Limited. With that brief profile, I will just introduce you to, to today's program. After this welcome note, I will request uh, the President INA, Professor Nil Manna, to kindly deliver his uh, address, after which there will be a talk by Mr. Kothwal, uh, followed by a short Q&A session, and we will end it with a vote of thanks. With that, I will request Professor Nil Manna, President INA, to kindly say a few words on today's uh, momentous occasion. What do you, sir? Thank you, Colonel Roy. Good evening to everybody uh, attending this meeting, particularly our chief guest, uh, Mr. Kotwal, uh, and a word of thanks from INE for his kind consent to address today. You just heard his profile, so obviously we couldn't have asked for anyone better to talk about the importance and what it takes to develop technology. But before actually I invite uh, Mr. Kotwal, I would like to uh, say a few words on behalf of Indian National Academy of Engineering. Uh, like we do our annual events, five of them routinely, religiously every year, starting with the INE Foundation Day on 20th April. Instantly this year, we celebrated the event from IIT Delhi and uh, two of our very eminent fellows, uh, Professor Rangan Banerjee, the current director of IIT Delhi, uh, address this event uh, and followed by uh, uh, Dr. Saraswat, member Niti Ayog, and former Secretary uh, DRDO. He spoke on uh, climate change and India's pathway for uh, net zero energy uh, security of the country. We celebrate the Foundation Day followed by the uh, National Frontiers of Engineering alongside innovations of manufacturing practices, then the Youth Conclave, Engineers Conclave, and finally, Annual Convention. In addition to these annual events, we also routinely celebrate or observe the important, three important, very important national days, 
namely the uh, Science Day, National Science Day on 28th February, Engineers Day on 15th of September, and Technology Day on 11th of May every year. Last year's event was jointly organized with the SN Bose Center in Calcutta, where uh, four of our fellows, including myself, uh, addressed. Now, this year, we decided that uh, we would like to uh, place a special focus on uh, technology development. And immediately, uh, Mr. Kotwal's name come to our mind for the simple reason that you just heard that 47 years he has been in the profession and uh, very deeply engaged with uh, delivery of systems, complete engineering systems. It's not just one component or one material or one single operation. And that's what exactly we want to inculcate in the, uh, in the minds of youngsters in the country and also remind our fellowship that we are dedicated to the profession of engineering. We are not just a bunch of engineers. And engineering, that kind of a practice that actually accrues benefit to the nation, gives economic boost to economic growth and technological self-reliance. Today, incidentally, also uh, the Technology Day celebration started nationally at the Progeti Madan, and Honorable Prime Minister addressed, and he stressed upon uh, some of the very important issues, but the theme for this year's celebration was school to startups igniting young minds to innovate. The very theme suggests that uh, the Prime Minister uh, wants to remind us that we are not only uh, soon turning to be the most populous, populous state in the whole world, uh, we also will be the youngest in the world. And that's demographic dividend. If uh, we really uh, are keen to harvest, then we must empower the youth. And the best way to do that is to uh, enable them to turn themselves through engineering and technological training into entrepreneurs so that they create more jobs than the number of job seekers we have in the country. So with this uh, in mind, I would also like to remind the audience here that INE is uh, very seriously pursuing the agenda of technological self-reliance for the country. And in that respect, from this year onwards, all the engineering sections, all 10 of them, uh, have been requested to come up with at least one technology roadmap document, which could be a forecast, which could be a technology gap analysis, which could be a certain recipe for mitigation of some of the uh, existing problems in this engineering sector. But essentially, we would like to create from every section at least one document, which will not only be unique, but first of its kind. And for that reason, um, in my opinion, if we continue to do that year on year, then obviously we'll add or provide a new value to the entire country on behalf of INE. Uh, this is also uh, very important for us to uh, remember that uh, while INE is pursuing its agenda in uh, utmost sincerity, we also have to pay an attention so that uh, apart from providing the intellectual input, we also emerge as financially uh, self-sufficient. And in that respect, maybe all the fellows, I would like to appeal again to help us, help the academy to uh, realize its uh, dream of raising an respectable corpus. To come back to the core issue, Mr. Kotwal, we all are uh, very keen to hear from you the journey through your entire professional career and the experiences and uh, both success and uh, challenges that you face so that uh, uh, not only the fellowship, but the entire youth uh, learn from you what it takes to develop technology. And uh, we will upload the lecture uh, in YouTube so that uh, anybody at a later time would like to see can certainly take, take the benefit of that. So thank you very much, Mr. Kotwal, once more and over to you now. Thank you, Professor Manna. And uh, I must thank INA to have given me this platform on this important day. Before I sort of begin my presentation, I would also like to thank 
first of all, Larsen and Tublo itself, because finally LNT has supported my experiments with technology for over 47 years. There are three other organizations, DRDO, ISRO, and NPCIL, who have contributed enormously to whatever little I know about technology. If these this backing had not been there, probably I would not be really talking to you today. Now, the coverage I want to give to technology is a little broader sense, and then we'll come to some specifics, which Professor Nanna mentioned. So looking at technology, I think we will all agree that it is a prime mover for national growth. And I will, through these slides, explain what I mean by that. Now, when you come to the I want to define technology purposely. You might wonder why I'm talking about definition of this kind of thing on to, uh, this date like today. Because unfortunately in recent times, technology has been associated with only one segment, which is the ICT sector. In fact, uh, I sometimes really do feel bad when the tech industry is exclusively that for the IT and such sectors. In fact, they call it the knowledge industry, which is even worse. So I thought I'll just mention to you that technology, I looked at this explanation or definition, it is the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. So this is essentially the background with which I want to start. You'll notice from the picture here, you know that we have advanced a lot, but then you look at what is written at the back, uh, at the bottom, it says, if it keeps up, man will atrophy all his limbs, but the push button finger. Now it aptly describes the current state of affairs and where we stand today with reference to what is called technology. The next one, I want to just define what are the current boundaries for technology. Now, this is, I thought quite interesting to set the perspective. So here I start with uh, the, what have we seen so far? How, what really, how far have we seen with technology? And the astounding figure is 30 billion light years. Just imagine that distance. It is, of course, through the James Webb telescope located 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. How far have we traveled? Now, we have already traveled, we as a humanity, through a vehicle, the Voyager 1, which was launched 46 years ago, have traveled 24 billion kilometers already. And it is traveling farther away at 61,500 kilometers per hour. How deep have we gone? We've gone 11 kilometers deep. You all know the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest known point of the seafloor, where the pressure is 1,071 times that at the sea level. And mind you, we have explored only 5% of the oceans so far. How fast have we gone? The recently launched NASA Parker Solar Probe using the sun's gravity has reached speeds of 5,35,000 kilometers per hour. And that is only 0.05% of the speed of light, some way to go. How small can we see, can we measure? The smallest we can see today is the size of an atom, which is 0.1 nanometers. Measurements are possible up to the tune of five into 10 raised to minus 20 meters. This is 2000 times smaller than a proton. And they say quarks are even smaller, but they don't really know by how much. Now, why I've put up this slide is, what is the kind of range that technology covers today? Now, this is to give you a broad perspective of where we have reached in technology. Now we come to another part. I mentioned right in the title slide that technology is a prime mover for national growth. How does that happen? Let us see what really has happened. Now, when you come to accelerating growth, this is a nice graph I found. It shows the picture for the last 600 and more years. Starts with the invention of the printing press, and then it travels year-wise, giving some landmark inventions and applications of technology over the years. And you will soon notice 
the pace of change that has occurred in the last maybe say 550 years or so. Look at the crowded graph at the right hand side. Now here, what it shows is there have been landmark achievements like from printing press, as I mentioned, the telescope was invented and then a steam engine, telegraph and so on. And then there was a sudden spurt. And this is what obviously industrial revolution and many other things have contributed. But now you can see the crowding that has occurred here. And if the graph is extended to the current day, probably it will be almost a vertical line and you can't make out a difference between dots at this scale. So the entire picture tells you that technology has grown, accelerated to unimaginable proportions. Now, what has it done to the world? And this is another interesting slide. It shows graphically what has happened to the per capita GDP of the world. Now, this take is an overall number. The number is so small in the beginning, which is year one, 001 or whatever you call it. And then it goes up to the present uh, period. You will see that there's hardly any because the graph is so uh, scaled is, is so small that you can hardly show the vertical line here. But then suddenly from 1700 or so, you see this spurt which has occurred. Now this is reality. It is in 1990 dollars the actual GDP of the world. And this remarkably shows more or less a similar line to what we saw in the earlier graph. It is no secret that technology has helped this huge change in the rate of growth of the world's GDP. Now let us look at the picture of where India stands in the Committee of Nations. This chart which was taken from Angus Madison's site with IMF. Now here you'll find that the GDP of the world is an economy history all in one chart, right from again, the year one to 2017. And it shows in various colors, which I hope are visible to you. But the yellow or maybe the orange, I would call it, is the Indian portion. Please notice that in the year one, it is around 40% of the world's GDP. Now you can see graphically what has happened to different countries. United States was just nowhere till the year 1700 or so. These are approximate years and see where it has gone as a percentage of the world's GDP. Now the interesting comparison is between China and India. Both were, both were more or less similar economies in the year one. And for some reason, which maybe is obvious to many is that the whole Indian contribution to the world economy has reduced substantially and it has come to a small figure. And you'll notice here that the, the contraction of the Indian contribution really somehow also more or less coincides with the accent on technology. I would like to surmise that where we as a country have missed out is to absorb and apply technology for our national good for various reasons. I don't want to get into that because that's another story. Having said that, this is reality again. Now you can see that China, which was almost the same level as India in 1960, 1970, how that has expanded its contribution to the world economy. India is also showing some tendencies to improve, but we have a long way to go. And of course, this is the US and other countries. Now we go to the next part. Here I want to give you just a few, uh, just a flavor of technologies which have got a high potential. Now I want to at the outset say, this is not an exhaustive list at all. It is just a few technologies which Personally, I am a little more familiar with. It does not mean that there are no other technologies or no other companies. There are a few slides, and I am sure you'll pardon me if some of them are from LNT. But the point I wanted to convey is a few technologies which have got tremendous potential to grow. And the reason I'm showing this is that the applications are such which have enabled us to achieve really commendable levels of technology. 
The first and obvious thing which everyone knows is about 3D printing. Now, 3D printing is a revolutionary technology, but it is not touching only what is commonly known. Of course, it is it is a revolution in manufacture of complex components and sub-assemblies. Automated production of edible products is an interesting thing where today edible products are being produced through 3D printing. Wonderful musical instruments are now being created through 3D printing. Now, the latest one, which one finds it difficult to believe, but the fact is the fashion industry is going to gain a lot by an advance in 3D printing of dresses. Then, of course, closer home, construction of entire houses and apartments. And last but definitely not the least, this is an emerging technology, 3D printing of body parts. Now, you can imagine from the statements here how this whole thing started with just an idea and now it has grown to such a proportion that it impacts almost every industry. And the most high potential part about this is the 3D printing of body parts. Of course, I must say it is at the initial stages. It is not, many of these technologies have not reached a level of maturity to say that they have become commonplace. But it has been established that even body parts and you know the cardiovascular systems can also be created by 3D printing. Certainly blood vessels and so on have already succeeded. So the world is a, a field for this kind of technology with 3D printing. Now let me show you a few examples of what has happened already. Now this is not only what has been achieved by large companies like LNT, it has been achieved by small startups who have recently gone into the game. And aerospace, as you know, is opening up as a major uh, domain for participation by literally hundreds of small and big companies. And this is what has, it has uh, uh, resulted in. You've got a, there's a monolith rocket engine already produced all by 3D printing. Now these shapes are pretty complex because there's an optimization of weight obviously involved in an, any aerospace object. Such things by conventional means would take months. Now it's a matter of hours and days. I mean, that's the kind of difference that 3D printing has done. Now we come to something which, let's say, because LNT is uh, also got into it in a substantial way in establishing that 3D printing can be a solution for creating residential as well as office premises in a record time. Of course, as time goes on, the cost of these such structures will come to more affordable levels. But what has been already established here for Indian Army, Border Roads Organization, Transit Residence at Chandigarh. This is already coming up. There is a check-in building at Grasim Chayar. Then there are prestige villas coming up at Bangalore. Now, the, you can see here, the, the limitation is only your imagination in terms of the shapes that you can create because there are certain machines which you can put in situ and create these using a, a particular type of concrete with built-in reinforcement or even net type of reinforcement. It reduces the weight and more importantly, just imagine that, that it reduces waste. It uses only as much material as is actually required for the final product. Now, these are some projects which have been completed already. A single story building in LNT Kanchi, LNT Real, they, they have created a show flat at Chennai, security building here. Then there was recently, you might have read about this post office building at Bangalore. It was just a matter of a few days and the whole thing was created. And so this is the beginning of a major advance in. 3D printing of residential apartments. Now we come to totally a different kind of a technology. Optical and laser scanning. Now we all know that yes, the scanning has existed for a number of years. What is so new about it? Now here, let me give you a story. When we started the manufacture of India's first nuclear powered submarine in Hazira, the dimensions were such that maintaining dimensional stability and even accuracy of measurement was a huge challenge. 
in the beginning, we started with conventional methods, the usual thing with either rods and dial gauges and tapes and so on, and calibrated tapes. But we soon realized the whole limitation in those. And then we went into the scanning technology. Now, when we did that scanning, I still remember the days when we had to prove the accuracy of scanning by using a conventional tape because the third party inspector was not familiar with this kind of technology and he wanted to make sure that what we were reporting in a scanned kind of a set of CAD points would be accurate. And we had to prove it, which is, of course, today it looks hilarious, but that is how it is. What are the products we were talking about? Now on the left hand side at the bottom, you see the section of a submarine. Obviously, for good reasons, I cannot explain all the details inside, but you can take just a view of the section. Imagine submarine is one of the most complex pieces of fabrication, primarily because contained in this very thin envelope, which again, it has to be thin because you reduce weight, but has to be very strong because you have to resist external pressure, hydraulic pressure when the submarine dives to a depth. Now inside it, there's a whole host of equipment, living quarters, you name it. And of course, massive torpedo systems and so on, and missile systems. So you can imagine the complexity of the internals. Now imagine going by conventional methods and trying to create this set it's a level of complexity. It would have been just a nightmare. We engaged the two major techniques, the laser scanning and laser projection with equipment which are shown there. And it revolutionized the process of measuring and transferring references. Imagine, first of all, you have to make it as circular as you can, but whatever is the actual shape has to be copied on other parts which go in. You may not believe it, but the equipment that goes inside a submarine today is completely scanned optically or using lasers before it even enters the assembly. So what we have is a computer scan of the entire envelope where the equipment is to be assembled. And in that we simulate on the computer, pardon me if I say we because yeah, I'm so attached to LNT so, but that's the reason. So today you will find that the equipment is scanned separately. The scanning of the envelope is done separately and a simulated assembly is done. Now the gaps are in millimeters or fractions thereof. And if you make a mistake, you are in trouble because you have to do all the correction while the assembly is going on, which is a very tightly packed thing. So this whole technology has enabled us to carry out a simulated scan and then reduce all those human errors, which are possible when you do things so-called as per drawing. There is nothing which really happens as per drawing. It is manufactured using drawings as a guideline, but the actuals are unknown. This particular technology gives you the advantage of copying the actuals on a computer model and then doing a simulated exercise. You might have heard that uh, LNT recently has completed more than 100 of these K9 Vajra howitzers. This is going to be a thing of the future. In fact, large numbers are coming in new orders and plus now we are getting into very light structures where uh, the lighter versions of these are coming out along with DRDO. Now you see this one, this is just a picture inside it. Now here again, you see, this is the place where the actual gunner sits and he has to cite that and so many uh, functions are performed. Just imagine creating this envelope and having everything matching. All this was possible only because of laser scanning and the optical methods. Now I come to totally another platform and that is the ones where the scanning is done on a much larger scale. So here the mounting platforms are like helicopters or drones or whatever you have, including even sometimes backpacks. And with LIDAR, optical, thermal, radars, of course, and sonar and sounding methods, these are various sensors. And today, large projects are done this way. I'll give you a picture using drones, how it is done. Now, this entire thing required laying out of certain lines for electrical lines and some for pipelines. In the good old days, this would have required weeks and weeks of work. Now, today, it is possible by using LIDAR, very accurate scanning, 
and the layout is done and then the whole thing, the topographic survey. It will help reducing cycle time up to 50% in such cases. So this is another major kind of technology which can revolutionize the entire field of construction. Now come to something not talked about. We have heard enough of drones in the recent Ukraine war, but what really is lurking underwater is something which has got much higher potential, both pluses and minuses. And this is the underwater application of guided vehicles. They're autonomous vehicles. Some of them are guided. There are special technologies for even communication from aircraft to those vehicles. So it's a whole new ball game. In fact, uh, just on the humorous side, just today I got in my email, I do subscribe to one particular site, which is a news site, which does not have any journals whatsoever. It's an AI generated news. And they gave an example of a person who is called the Prince of Submar Sub Semi Submersibles. He has been arrested recently for 30,000 pounds of cocaine transported to US in a clandestine manner using semi submersibles. So this is only an aside, but you can see the power and the kind of range with this kind of thing and cover. It can communicate from here to air and with the ships, of course, and terrestrial objects. This is the kind of range that are, they are offered. The countermeasure vessels. Then, of course, there are surveys, uh, vessels, surveillance vessels. Then there are, and surprisingly, some of them, since they have to operate, for example, if you have to do a survey of ocean of an, uh, one complete ocean, you need a vehicle which will go in and will not require recharging. There is nothing like recharge. So there are methods involved where wave energy is used for recharging that. So on a continuing basis, this whole thing can move. So this is the kind of scope that the new things. Now, another one that is a really challenging one and which probably people are not so well aware is digital twins. Now, digital twin is a very interesting concept. It is basically a digital copy of a physical asset so that it completely copies what is going on in real life. But with the range of applications that is opened up, of course, in aerospace, automotive, architecture, construction, you name it. Medical is another area where digital twins have been used already. They have created a digital twin of a, a particular human system so that you can do all your experiments, even surgeries and all that can be planned, and then you actually do the real thing. So this is, again, a very powerful technology. You will not believe, at least I found it unbelievable, that EU has today got a program. By 2050, they want to become climate neutral. They've got two programs, Green Deal and Digital Strategy. They want to have a Earth digital twin. It's a 10-year destination Earth initiative. It's going to consume 20 megawatts of power. It's a fantastic program, but you can see the range that digital twins can offer. In, of course, our own area, we have already used digital twins for planning of the movement of items inside the workshop. You can actually lay out the entire workshop. You can have production lines and create a digital twin, do it on the computer rather than, and once you finalize everything, then you start moving on the ground. So this is a powerful technology. I'll give you one very interesting input. COVID, when it was uh, really all over the place, uh, TCS here, they've got their R&D and design center in Pune, and you'll not believe it, they created a digital twin for the city of Pune. And they could simulate what could happen with various decisions, whether one area locked out, what will be the impact and so on. It was a very interesting thing. They, their predictions matched closely with reality and the municipal corporation was very happy. They engaged them in some areas. So that's the level it can reach. The same organization has created a digital twin for a human skin. I mean, I found it mind boggling. So this is the range that digital twins cover. Coming to the other area of metallurgy and welding, I just want to bring out a few slides uh, where all of you or most of you are familiar that welding is an old ancient technology and so is metallurgy. So what's happening today? Here is a view of the new forge facility, for heavy forging facility set up. This is a 7426 JV, 74 LNT, 26 is Nuclear Power Corporation. The whole process is shown. We have a 120 ton electric arc furnace. We make ingots up to 300 tons a piece, forge them into cylinders, quench them, machine them, and you can see the finished product. It's, the dimensions may not be very visible to you. It is 5.3 meters outside diameter, 700 meet, millimeters long, and it's 750 millimeters thick. I mean, that's the kind of a forging single piece, uh, which of course, to nuclear standards, you can imagine how critical that would be. 
this is a pride for our country and we as, as a company lnt is quite proud that we have been associated with creating this the world's largest system for refrigeration it is a cryostat imagine the diameter is about 30 meters diameter and 30 meters height weighing 3500 tons it went into some 54 sections to france where it is being assembled and now here you can see the complexity it is stainless steel you all know that stainless steel behaves very Finally, when welding is done, a lot of heavy distortion, much more than normal steels, and control of deformation location is vital. So that is where we have developed, our people have developed a lot of interesting technologies, and they have enabled this to happen. Now, there have been some other capability enhancements, again, the use of technology. Now, here you can see a CAD model of a complex piping structure. This is the actual, and this is then fed back to the designer in situ so that he can find out if there's any change required and so on. Of course, there are mobile apps and all that which help monitoring. This is an interesting application where the object is in a Hazira. Now it requires inspection. The inspector is located either at his house in India or in, even in France because we had to have data transferred to, to France. Now all that this person is doing, the inspector has worn smart goggles, smart glasses. They capture the image transfer that whole thing there and communication is possible. And this can be used to great advantage if you want a new person to start a process, a welding process or anything like that or heat treatment. All his instructions will come on the smart glass. So he doesn't have to look around. He doesn't have to get approximate instructions. Now coming to manufacturing, of course, we have talked a lot about pressurizers and nuclear and all that. But look at the other things all of us know that uh, the whole metros and such things are becoming commonplace, but look at the technology behind it. And at one time, all these machines used to be imported. Today, all this is manufactured in India, in-house. So now we are self-sufficient. Now there are some game-changing technology. Now this is not to do anything with either l &T or anywhere. It's a worldwide thing, which has been, uh, you know, if you look at, consult various experts, what are the real technologies which can make a difference? These are, again, these are the broad um, the list of few of them, but these are the ones which futurologists and experts say are going to create the maximum impact in the world in the years to come. Artificial intelligence, augmented and virtual reality, blockchain, I'm sure many of you would know what this is all about. The drones, of course, we talked about a little bit about it. Robotics and digital assistance, 3D printing, nanotech, quantum and edge computing. This quantum is going to be one of the next wonders which uh, the younger generation will take the benefit of. Synthetic biotech, huge uh, potential because genomics and all that comes in this, how it can be used and you can create or destroy various things which are in uh, existence. And then there are new materials, materials which have been built from ground up. Space technologies, of course, is another area. So these are the broad list of, now there's no way one can deal with all of these but I just want to touch just one or two of them. Now here is a picture showing these technologies and there's a human hand, but you can see that there is a certain resistance uh, or other hesitation because the, this each of these has got impacts, either the usage of energy, the kind of impact it can have, pluses and minuses. And I would like to stress here that there is, the more powerful the technology, the more powerful are the consequences of its abuse. You name the technology and you can see how it can be used, it can be abused. So there are risks involved. There are huge opportunities, there are huge risks. So what I've tried to do here is, without going into too much detail, some few things which come to mind is what I have tried to list out. In the meantime, there was recently a breaking news. The breaking news is that scientists have found a way to use brain scans and artificial intelligence modeling to transcribe, they call it the gist of what people are thinking. Now, can you just imagine what this is going to imply? This is, of course, it's a baby, first baby step. The person who was involved, he says, this is like in a hundred point scale, we have gone from zero to one, and we have still a long way, number of years, research and all that. It's not to say that it's ready, but this is the shape of things to come. Many times people scoff at artificial, oh, it is not going to be, it's too much hype. Really, it is not going to happen, but the seeds of change 
of a very drastic kind are already with us. And the more we are aware of both the opportunities and the risks, we will be better off. And this is what I wanted to imply. Now look at the positive potential, just of one of those game changing things that is the positive potential of AI. Now here, of course, we uh, all know that chat GPT and all that have created a storm and many people say that it is going to create a big problem. And uh, I could, uh, uh, you know, I, I would recommend two things. If any of you have not already seen a TED talk by Gary Kasparov, who uh, talks about his own feelings when he lost against, uh, you know, the, um, the computer in a game and his own reactions to it something which is worth uh, hearing. The other is, of course, uh, you all heard of Khan Academy, and that person talks about the impact of, possible impact of, and what he has already done in using artificial intelligence for education. And the best part of it is, in a classroom where you've got 40 and 50 students, it is impossible to have personal attention that teacher can give. With this technology, individual children can have personal attention of the kind of education that he or she needs. And this is something which is can create a, a kind of a new dimension to education. Similarly, the case in healthcare. Now, just imagine one of the biggest problems India has is not that we lack in the level of knowledge. I think we have some of the best in the world, but then they are concentrated in some larger cities. What happens in the rural areas? How does technology reach there? Well, how does the right technology reach there? There are many people who will claim they have the knowledge, but they do not have the science behind it. So there are several such issues. This it can create a sea change, the use of AI in healthcare. And this is a topic by itself. There are many experts in this audience, I'm sure, who know much better about this than I do. The third point is democratization of decision-making. See here with AI, if you use it positively, of course, you don't need to concentrate decision-making in a few individuals or organizations. It is democratized. Anyone who has access has got the ability to participate in decision-making and the speed therefore increases. Blockchain, it is a whole uh, new ball game. We only talk about that to connect to cryptocurrency, but let me tell you, blockchain has the potential to, to cover so many different processes, regular processes, which we are today doing in the hard way. It has the capability of minimizing bias and of course, corruption and illegal transaction, uh, transactions. Now in combination with improved communication, 6G for example, which is on the cards, it can reduce inequality. This is something which I would like all of you to think about, which is one of the major problems that India has, inequality, which is only growing. And of course there is a positive impact on global commerce. But then lurking behind that is AI, the gorilla in the room. And it is obvious that higher the gains, higher the risk. AI has the highest potential in both. Some of the risks associated with that, of course, are, you know, in intelligence we are talking about, it's really the driver, the key base for innovation. Now, if we are handing it over to something where you have no control, what could happen is both the direction and pace of that change could surpass our own imagination. I mean, today, we, if we believe that, oh, AI is just those things which people talk about, but if we really see the seeds of things which have happened already, then it will definitely give you a feeling that, is it likely to go out of control? Now, this is only now AI, but add computer, quantum computing to it, and it can, it is going to go in up by exponential uh, limits. Then comes the- Kothal, you accidentally got muted. Okay. Sorry, sorry. sorry. I think it may have been done by the controls. I don't have. It. No. We can hear you now, sir. It's quite all right. Yeah, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Right. So the symbol is there. Anyway, so uh, basically, uh, I don't know how much uh, I missed uh, conveying, but basically, I was just talking about the potential on the negative side that AI has. Now, recently, we'll find a rush to the mark to market products, which are just with half baked understanding of risks, and this could create really serious problems. Ethics and accountability, as we are all aware, these are the very cornerstones of our law and order framework. And if that becomes weak, where are we going to go? And of course, warfare, we have heard enough of it. Today, really, it has reached a limit where warfare will be not between 
other weapons, but with one algorithm versus another. That is what will decide the result of warfare in the years to come. Now, there is also going to be a churn in skills. Now, when I talk about churn, it is not really a disappearance of jobs alone. In fact, I did some reading in the subject. There is really no concern in one segment of our society. There'll be enough jobs of a particular kind. But if we don't do something real and fast, there could be serious risks in employment. So I like this sentence, the real danger is not that computers will begin to think like men, but that men will become, will begin to think like computers. So really well stated statement. Now, what is the likely impact on India? Just as I look at it, there's nothing where I can say that this is the only thing that can happen. But I've just tried to put down some of the things which came to mind. See, the educated white collar staff can be quite comfortable that number of jobs are not going to disappear. However, the kind of jobs is going to change. It is said that clerical jobs or things which require a lot of this movement of paper are going to disappear. Now, the same people today, a large number are engaged in that kind of a job including, let me tell you, journalists, because there will be no need for journalists, as I was just mentioning, uh, news channel already started. So this kind of thing is going to be in trouble. Now, the second part, which is very scary as far as I'm concerned, we tend to give lesser emphasis than required to higher education, R&D. And in fact, there, I heard a very good webinar from Professor Arindam Ghosh at IIC, uh, IIC. Now, he was mentioning that there is such a huge potential in quantum and others, but where are the PhDs? So, if they, otherwise what will happen is Indian educated youth will generally get only lower end jobs, so the data collection, analytics and so on, but will not participate in designing new things and that's a real concern. So, India otherwise will continue to follow rather than lead in all these emerging technologies. We cannot afford to do that. And therefore, what I think is, it is necessary to identify a few areas. We cannot do too many. Areas involving concept and design, leading to global intellectual property rights. Now, which are those? In this, I, I'm a layman in these, so I just thought that we should identify those areas where the gap between the best in the world and India is not so large as, you know, how do we even make up? So quantum computing is today, maybe there are people five years ahead of us or seven, 10 years ahead of us, the max. But there's a whole field because this requires a knowledge of mathematics and physics and Indians are supposed to be good at it. So quantum is opening a new world in computing, communications and materials. You must have heard of communication as a, you know, the with uh, entangled particles, what can happen to communication is something unimaginable. Materials, new materials, as I mentioned, can design, be designed using quantum. And then 6G and bioengineering. Bioengineering is something, again, part of that syn synthetic bio, biosynthetic uh, approaches and it is again a world open and we have such high level of medical skills. Maybe if that is combined, that could be an opportunity. So these, a few of these should be done in mission board where investment has to be happen if we are to keep, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a wish that we will lead at least in some. The other part, if we don't do reskilling, like now I'm talking about the large number of people engaged in the unorganized sector. You know how so many people suffer during the COVID part. Now, this unorganized sector is massive in size. How are they going to be reskilled? Because many other jobs will disappear. This is a very serious challenge and we need to do that. And I want to mention here, increasing inequality is a serious concern. I was really stunned. If you take 50%, the bottom 50% of all Indians and compare them to the top 1%, what do you think is the ratio of what they earn? And I was amazed the ratio is 81 means if the in the bottom 50%, I'm not talking about the last 5%, 50% of India and the top 1%, the ratio is 1 is to 81. I mean, this kind of, and the other concern is it's only increasing. Now, it is recorded that check technologies can worsen this. So this is something which is quite a concern. Now, I want to end with one story. I don't know how many of you know about this gentleman the man who saved the world. And this gives you a little picture. Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov of Russia, born 39 and expired at the age of 77 in May 2017. 
with two pictures of his. This gentleman was posted in one of the outposts in Russia, you know, in the Cold War. This happened actually in September 20, I mean 1983, so not too long back, just 40 years back. And his job was to man a station which will monitor any activity going on from the US. This, when he was observing, he got on his system a clear indication that US had launched missiles into Russia. Now, he observed and he got one immediately after that, second, third, fourth, and fifth, five missiles. He got a signal on his computer and system that these have been fired. Now, his job was to be the watchdog for the whole country. I mean, five missiles, nuclear capable, you can see what devastation it can have. Now, his job was immediately to inform his bosses that such a thing has happened. So please retaliate. And the Russian retaliation system was so strong and is so strong that within minutes, it can again launch uh, retaliatory attacks and destroy a lot of people. This person used what he himself has called his gut feel. I, I am amazed. I just uh, trying to imagine myself in that position. I just can't imagine what would I have done. Now this person, he says, no, there's something wrong. And the logic he had in his mind was if US has to destroy Russia, they'll not only do it with five missiles. So he, he did not inform his bosses. And with this, do you know the kind of disaster he has saved? If he had informed his bosses, there would have been havoc. It is estimated that around 600 million people would have died. And subsequently, starvation, there are experts who have gone to it, 2 billion people would have been affected and died because of hunger, because devastation that it can cause to the nuclear holocaust. Now, this is the single person whose presence of mind prevented this catastrophe. And therefore, I brought this out, technology versus the human intuition. And this is why I want to end this presentation by this sentence, the human spirit must prevail over technology. Of course, said by no other than Albert Einstein. So thank you very much. I just wanted to cover a broad picture of technology and some details, but I would welcome any questions. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Mr. Kotwal. I think our decision, uh, not just Anistar, our decision to invite you for this Technology Day presentation also was immensely successful and correct decision. So uh, I, I'm sure you, you won't mind taking one or two questions. Uh, and I see a large audience. Uh, will anybody uh, be uh, willing to uh, make a comment or ask anything to Mr. Kotwal? But meanwhile, Mr. Kotwal, uh, your last example uh, certainly underscores the need of uh, having a leash on AI-based decision-making. Yeah. Had AI been in the vogue, then we can very well imagine AI wouldn't think, would definitely, uh, you know, go towards pressing the button. So there is the danger. So, so basically two things come out here. One is, as I said, the first uh, quotation which I gave, the man should not think like a computer, otherwise even that will fail. And the other one is technology should not become our master. So how do we achieve it with this uh, thing which is already released to the world is going to be a challenge. It is not regulations which are going to do the job alone because there'll be always people who will flout it. Take the no. case of human cloning. I mean, human cloning is banned in several countries and there are some countries merrily proceeding ahead. What happens when they come out with these clones? There may people have to respond. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, in the name of research, we already know what havoc it caused that uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, if there are questions. Uh, good evening, Mr. Kotwal. This is Sudhir Nirantar here. I'm just fascinated by a vast knowledge and vast information that you have shared just now on this seminar. Uh, it shows the depth and extent of reading and uh, information uh, hungry that you have. You are. I have one question. You you mentioned about uh, uh, your talk with IISC uh, professor who said that we need more and more people to uh, to go into higher education and 
uh, get their PhDs and uh, get a lot of knowledge in depth. Uh, of course, uh, that's the, the way that a country progresses. But then as you see these days and for past several years, not these days, the top talent, the top engineers uh, always uh, seek uh, opportunities abroad. Uh, they, they would go either for masters or uh, with few years of experience, they would seek a job outside. So how, how do you tackle this issue, which is uh, nothing but a brain drain and uh, it's been discussed for uh, perhaps few decades? My response would be, let us look at a very similar example. In fact, a worse example. Look at China. They had a, a big uh, handicap of not even knowing the English language. Let me tell you, when a Chinese you speak to, they, they are lost when you talk in English. And it has the same problem. They also had a brain drain, but they did find a mechanism by which Chinese people went to the best of universities, picked up the latest knowledge, found some ways of bringing back that technology to China. I mean, you may call it copying and all that, that's neither here nor there. Finally, for their nation, they have upscaled their technology to levels where today they've become virtually a challenge for us itself so it is possible yes for example if you take people from iits and i have nothing against iits in particular so don't uh, um, look at it that way but there are very intelligent students from different areas of india in fact intelligence wise there's absolutely nothing lacking when it comes to rural areas imagine a situation where a scheme is created where that level of people is taken there, they years and brought back. They will come back. Their roots are here. So I agree that it's a challenge, but there's also a solution. And we need to really delve deeper, but we have to solve it. We cannot live with the same problem year on year or decade after decade. Mr. Kothwal, please allow me to make a comment here for the benefit of the, uh, the audience. Uh, this the apprehension, uh, Mr. Sudhir Nirantar has expressed was true until about a few decades ago. Now the top students don't go abroad. Now what we see is a lateral shift of the students to areas and professions which are which have very little to do with core engineering. They drift towards finance, towards banking sector and uh, service sectors, which are which don't require any engineering knowledge any uh, smart person can do. Anyway, I thought I would just make a mention. Why it might be true uh, about the bright students seeking different career than engineering, but in engineering and technology, I still find huge number of bright engineers move, moving to either Europe. Now Europe is new thing coming in, but mostly to US. Yeah, no, I agree. It is a problem. It needs to be solved. But then we have so many of them. Please let yeah. us understand that if we just step up the numbers. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, I mean, uh, the point that you raised and when you talked about Chinese, perhaps the the very strong nationalistic kind of a, uh, you know, upbringing that these uh, people might have had uh, from yeah. the young days. Uh, motivated them to go back to their country and contribute in a positive way. So perhaps You're that right. is something that we need to work on. Uh, in yeah. fact, I know of a, a, a first-hand uh, experience of a, my friend. Uh, he, he was in Japan and then he, he asked the Japanese guy, uh, what do you like about India and what you don't like about India? And that guy was straightforward when it came to say, saying about the, uh, the uh, what you don't like. He, say I, he said that I see very little, uh, you know, national pride and uh, uh, nationalistic uh, kind of uh, approach amongst yeah. most of the Indians. Yeah, uh, Mr. Naranda, there is some two or three people who want to talk. Mr. Yeah. Sanat Kumar has been uh, wanting to... He's a very senior sure. person. I would love to hear what he says. Mr. Sanat Kumar? Uh, can you hear me, uh, Mr. Kotwal? Yes, yes, I can. I okay. can see you. Uh, my question is rather simple because it was one of curiosity with the story that you told in the end. So what did that Russian gentleman do? He didn't inform his uh, seniors, but he must yeah. have done something. Uh, very... To... 
yeah very interesting you know finally because his gut feel told him that this is not going to this is not an attack on russia you know what actually has, uh, really happened there was a, a kind of reflection from clouds which some satellites picked up reflection from cloud that reflection misled the system saying that it is a trigger for a launch from missiles in us so he just uses gut feel and did not inform anyone and it so turned out that he saved the world i mean that's the kind of thing which uh, this turns out so he didn't, he didn't do anything he simply kept quiet in fact let me tell you also the funny part is uh, he was hauled up later on and reprimanded by the russian <laughs> uh, seniors saying that he why did he not complete his records and so on huh? it is only later on that he was awarded uh, you know in uh, us and all that yeah thank Next, you any, thank you Lakshmesh wanted some questions. Lakshmesh. Uh, sir, good evening and uh, can, I hope you can hear me. Yes, uh, I can hear and see you. Great to see you and also it was amazing uh, you know, to hear you. Sir, I just have one question now. Uh, you, you touched upon the, the way technology word itself has got reconfigured these days. And uh, what is your suggestions to us on how to bring back manufacturing as technology and enhance the contribution of manufacturing to the Indian GDP. Question number one. Question number two is, what's your view on the space sector? Thank you, sir. Okay, great questions. Now, uh, taking the first one, see, uh, let me tell you that what has transformed in the early days, I'm sure you'll recollect that, Yes, there was manufacturing was given a certain predominance and there was a certain element of respect for that in society. Actually, the transformation has occurred not because of any individuals. What has happened is that the methodology on basis of which today manufacturing must base itself has changed. The whole, you can say, for example, today, if you go by ancient methods of manufacturing, people will not find it of use. Young people will not find it of great uh, importance or excitement to work in such kind of atmospheres. So using AI or using IT or such technologies, if you transform manufacturing, I'm guaranteeing you that manufacturing will get back at that age because then they will see the power of these technologies in use. That is the reason I gave you some of the examples which you yourself are very well aware that these things, if you start using it more and more, I mean, you take a young engineer who comes out of college, if he's told, okay, you have a choice of getting into an exciting field where such technologies are actually being used, or, or um, uh, Professor Manna pointed out a very important part about systems. It's a complex thing. I mean, the system, for example, that Vajra, it's a total system, not a component. Now his mind works on something exciting. If you create that excitement in, in the manufacturing, it certainly will get back its original place. That's my view. Now, I, if there's no more hands raised, then... Sir, the, the second question was related to the space sector. It's opening yeah. up and what's uh, your space, view? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. See, you space are the sector. partner of space. <laughs> no, I, I must tell you that uh, space has reached a level which is very exciting. And the only thing I regret is I'm not uh, young anymore. The issue is that today it has opened up to a, a level where young people are coming forward with outlandish kind of things using the older experienced people as a kind of in an advisory role. I mean, you see so many Agni Kool and so many other people who are there, young startups, they say, okay, we want, they spend a couple of years in ISRO and then they're out on their own and they start looking at uh, making a complete engine out of 3D printing or carbon fiber. You are aware of all that. Uh, you must be aware also that a rocket has already flown in the US which is entirely done by 3D printing or 85, 90% by 3D printing. Now, if this kind of thing goes on and aerospace offers the maximum scope in terms of the hardware, because there are enough other things, medical is another area, but you look at it this way that once you give this kind of a scope, which is, I am glad to see that number of people who are enthused by what are the opening up that has taken place in the recent years, startups are given prominence, that the excitement is there to start it. Now, the real answer to your question will be, will it sustain? 
will a startup which has got exciting ideas uh, will they be able to sustain their business in the years to come now this is going to open up because now i see a great uh, trend towards the same isro now teaming up with young people to really develop new systems now this is an ideal combination so once people have that mindset out of their mind that okay now this is something which we can do the private sector and public sector are different and we must not talk to each other i mean those are mindsets i like to quote uh, dr shelkar um, uh, you know he puts things in a very elegant way and a simple language he says the problem in india is the battle between minds and mindsets is the indian mind the best the mindsets are not if we change our mindset that we can do it we are indians who have the capability and technology already then we can do it now in isro and the whole partnership which is coming up i can see beginnings of that i am not suggesting that suddenly everything has changed now you will find that like for example if an lnt hl combination is making a complete rocket on its own and it's only gets an order that okay we require so many rockets in so many years the number of people who will get involved will be so large with the flexibility that a private sector can offer in combination with hl i think it's a great kind of thing so space is a huge frontier there's no limit to it i mean you just imagine the kind of things that uh, even in the war recently what starlink did to let's say even the ukraine's uh, capability i mean all communication of space you're talking about internet communication today you're you're going to talk about quantum internet tomorrow and that will open up a completely new dimension so space is a limitless frontier and i think that you a great thing to go ahead thank you thank you sir thanks a lot okay um, so mr kotwal please accept our rts uh, congratulations for this excellent talk and our gratitude uh, it certainly uh, is evident that you took enormous uh, effort to uh, create uh, a very interesting set of slides and uh, i would say the presentation also made it so so lucid that it was it certainly kept all of us very much glued to the screen so once again on behalf of ini ms kotwal please uh, accept our grateful thanks and uh, maybe in the future we'll try to uh, utilize your expertise in a much better way thank you so much thank you thank you all and thank you for the audience i really appreciate the kind of interest shown and all the best to all of you all of you are going to contribute to technology in some way thank you thank you sir yeah we bring the session to a close now thank you all thank, thank you. you sir thank you.